Aloha. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Jerry's Hedges、uh, as a great speaker, I believe,、uh, of this video, video series. <clears throat> In general,、uh, doctors or physicians、uh, can be a clinician to take care of the patient, but also like a researcher or educator, and also sometimes manager or administrator. Uh, and in the medical school,、uh, dean, dean is the、uh, top、uh, manager of the school itself.、Uh, Jess Hedges uh, is, uh, used to be an、uh, emergency medicine、uh, physician, but then uh, uh, last uh, 15 years or so, until last year,、uh, Jess、uh, served as the uh, dean uh, and uh, make、uh, medical school. Uh, one of the you know, top schools in the United States.、Uh, and、uh, I'm pretty sure today j a y s presentation will be very helpful for the、uh, future young generation、uh, who may be interested in a、uh, medical career in the future. So, j a y s thank you very much for com uh, uh, coming here today. And、uh, I really appreciate your time. and uh, 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 I really like to uh, uh, listen to your、uh, presentation. All right. Thank, thank you very much.、Uh, I am quite pleased to、uh, provide this talk, and I hope, as、uh, Dr. Machi says, it will be of value to、uh, our young physicians in the future.、Um, and it's a lot about、uh, what we can do beyond simply practicing medicine,、mm -hmm. how we can leverage our experience. Uh, uh, this is、uh, 113 of this series,、uh, present to the future doctor. And uh, Dr. Jules Hedge is a、uh, uh, uh, Jabsom, which is a、uh, University of Hawaii、uh, medical school,、uh, Dean Emeritus. And、uh, uh, Jules talked about as a、uh, catchphrase, maybe as a physician, as a leader. Okay, now all of you, are, so please do your presentation. All right. Thank you, Dr. Machi. So,、um, as you see on this slide, this is the、uh, front of our medical school, which is in the very、uh, nice tropical setting、uh, on the island of Oahu、uh, in Hawaii.、Um, we, it's customary for giving a talk to mention any sort of financial conflict. And、uh, I don't have one, but I. Like to poke fun at the whole idea of talking about conflicts.、Uh, so, hopefully, you'll forgive me for a little attempt at humor on this slide. Okay.、Um, I, I, as Dr. Machi said, we're going to talk a bit about leadership as a physician and what one can do above and beyond their clinical role.、Uh, and I'm going to take you through several steps. So, to begin, we'll talk about my journey.、Um, As a learner to、um, become eventually a dean of a medical school, a little bit about the roles of the dean within、mm -hmm. a medical school, and then what I call competencies, or they may be、uh, skill sets. And we won't be able to list them all, but I would hope that we'll be able to cover some of the really key competencies that、mm -hmm. help、uh, make someone be a great leader. Uh, in a、uh, healthcare setting or in an academic setting.、Uh, and then finally, we'll close on some of our responsibilities、uh, in that role as a leader.、Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going. And、uh, so, a little bit about my background.、Um, I grew up in the、uh, Pacific Northwest on the continent of North America in the state of Washington,、mm -hmm. um, a small farm. And、uh, Attended、uh, school in the state of Washington, becoming an engineer,、um, going through several iterations.、Uh, and the, my last degree、uh, was a master's degree in chemical engineering, which gave me、um, a bit of a、um, sort of a, a balanced look at applying engineering to medicine.、Um, I've always been fascinated by the application of science. Uh, to medical challenges. And、uh, following my medical school, I chose the field of emergency medicine and trained in Philadelphia at what was then called the Medical College of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, this is the same institution as Dr. Machi uh, during <laughs> that. That's right. So aerospace is uh, you, the part of the your engineering uh, uh, study you did. Aerospace is uh, what yes. did you do? <laughs> well, I was uh, largely a learner at that time uh, oh. and didn't uh, get into uh, you know the work in the industry. I but I got a batch, bachelor's degree in aerospace. Oh, really? And okay. then uh, while applying to medical school, I got a master's degree. Oh. So, you know, in aerospace, one of the interesting things is obviously you're designing structures that are going to be moving uh, through some sort of a fluid or, or gas, hmm. and they have to have propulsion. They have to have management of the weight so they're they're not too heavy to get oh. off the <laughs> ground and they have to be structurally sound so they don't rip apart uh, under see. extreme stress uh additionally um you've got to you know you carry your fuel with you and you have uh, control systems and feedback loops so uh all of engineering sort of comes together mm. in aerospace and um uh, that's one of the things that I liked about it is because it was eclectic and, and combined a lot of problem solving, uh, whether it be electrical engineering, structural engineering, uh, materials science, and so forth. I see. <laughs> anyway, so after medical school and uh, during my residency and subsequently, I um, began to apply um, for both education and research some of my engineering skills to some of the time sensitive conditions that we manage in emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. And although I have been involved in many more areas than what I'm showing here, mm -hmm. uh, these are some of the areas that I took a very deep dive. Um, a lot of things related to cardiac emergencies, emergency pacing, uh, resuscitation, evaluation of uh, cardiac ischemia or heart attacks, um, public access to fibrillation so that lay people could be part of the EMS response, mm. trauma resuscitation, and then the systems of trauma care, how oh, we see. work together across hospitals and with the emergency services. Mm. So that's a, sort of the main focus I had academically. But as one is academically engaged, there are different things that you get asked to do or you get engaged in that sort of help build your opportunities for the future. Mm. So working with several teams, we put together grants for these different areas of science that I ex showed on the last slide. Uh, we worked on collaborations across disciplines for resuscitation and work both in the hospital and outside of the hospital. Uh, through emergency medical services, mm -hmm. EMS. Uh, in addition to having a leadership role on some of the research grants, I was also for a while the institutional head of the Human Subjects Committee or what was uh, later called the Institutional Review Board. Now, this, right. this is an interesting responsibility because it means you become aware of all of the research that's being done at your institution, oh, right. the other investigators, and you can begin to uh, work with them. And uh, they can see you as a, a colleague and someone who might be able to do cross-discipline uh, research with them. Uh, through, through some of the success in the research, I was um, held a number of positions with the uh, academic arm for emergency medicine mm -hmm. and was selected the president. Uh, I subsequently became the department chair at the Oregon Health and Science University and, and headed up the uh, trauma hospital uh, there in Portland. Uh, and at that time, I became the as department chair, be became a member of the Association of Academic Chairs of Emergency Medicine, eventually the president of that group. Now, I mentioned these things because they sort of are opportunities to sort of build on uh, themselves. As you get known in an area, your uh, opportunities to interact are, are broadened. And the sort of things you get asked to do um, to 
kind of advanced science and education in the areas you've been working on mm -hmm. tend to grow. Uh, I was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in the year 2000, and this was uh, a really a, a nice uh, gesture. I was really surprised to be involved in that. But once mm -hmm. you uh, are asked to be a member, then other opportunities within the National Academy uh, oh, come to play. Um, and also um, sort of two things happened as I was um, wrapping up what I thought was going to be my term as uh, as a dean of an academic department. I um, took on the uh, chief of staff for the hospital I was at, and I was asked to serve as a vice dean at uh, Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine. How long were you in uh, so Oregon? I was there for 20 years. Oh, 20 years, I see. <laughs> yeah. So, so during that time, a lot of responsibilities, opportunities uh, come your way, and the opportunity to do research grows. Uh, after uh, serving as vice dean for several years, I was given this wonderful opportunity to come to Hawaii mm -hmm. at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and to serve as the dean of the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And so as, we, are, as, we are very lucky to have you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, again, I, I'm telling you about all these things that I've done, not not to try to impress anyone, but to, again, reinforce that if one is uh, interested in leadership, mm -hmm. um, as you kind of move forward with many of your activities, uh, you'll find that they, they will build into greater opportunities and responsibilities. So, uh, and then, as you said, uh, Dr. Machi, I served as the dean for 15 years at the University of Hawaii, and then subsequently uh, did the, um, uh, I am serving as a uh, dean emeritus, still a <laughs> part-time faculty and enjoying working with Dr. Machi and others. I see. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Machi thought this would be a good uh, photo to put into the <laughs> slide set. And right. it's, a, it's a portrait that yeah. uh, sits in what I call the rogues gallery, uh, where all of the uh, former deans of the uh, medical school mm -hmm. have had their portraits. Uh, unfortunately, all of them have died. So I think it might be a message that my, <laughs> no, my no. Uh, time is short. <laughs> no, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> So in talking about what a dean does, um, these are the topics we're going to talk about. And I'm not going to read those because we're going to come over the, them one by one. But I, I want to emphasize that when you are given such a wonderful opportunity to serve as a dean or a, a CEO of some uh, entity that's providing uh, healthcare delivery or doing product development, it, it's not only an honor, but it's really about how you can serve those mm. that you're responsible for. And that's a philosophy that I took into this endeavor. I see. So, so I wanted to just give a few examples of some of the service things that uh, we've done at Jamsom. Uh, some of these started prior to my time, but one of the responsibilities as a dean is to sustain those activities and also to... Um, try to expand or, or, you know, take them in new directions. So one the, is the home project, which uh, Dr. Machi is very familiar with. It's a, a project where our faculty have reached out to the community and have been providing health care for some 10,000 citizens on uh, our island who do not have a home. Many of them are living in tents. Some are just living in on cardboard boxes that they have and cover with blankets or a sleeping bag and live outside. But um, their health care is a significant uh, issue. And so we've been trying to expand and deliver that care. And we do it not by bringing the patients to our facility, but going to where they are right. with uh, mobile vans. And when I came, we had one very old mobile van that was breaking down about every other month. And now we have three brand new vans <laughs> that are covering the area. 
I see. And usually uh, students uh, serve for this uh, project uh, a lot, right? Right. There are some faculty advisors, but the much of the care is delivered by the students. And some of the, the students, this is their first exposure to actually delivering care. Mm. Yeah. So they take care of wounds. They help uh, patients with diabetes, give them instructions and uh, do glucose checks, uh, do vaccinations. Uh, so a number of supportive things. Um, they can't do you know, major procedures, but mm. they, they do uh, some minor ones so uh, where possible. Mm. I was going to just mention briefly that, um, you know, on one of the other islands of Hawaii, uh, there is a um, small town, about uh, 55,000 people uh, population, and it's uh, Hilo on the island of Hawaii. Mm. Uh, they had a real challenge uh, about 10 years ago where the average age of their OBGYN doctors was over 60 years. Mm. And we wanted to uh, provide uh, an opportunity for younger doctors to come into the community, to be a part of the community. But to do that, um, we had to really craft uh, a practice that would survive. So we had to take care of all of the financial aspects, hire the practitioners, uh, manage the support personnel, uh, get contracts for uh, service coverage at the local hospital mm -hmm. for emergency deliveries. So we did a lot of work to build that practice. And now they have six young OBGYN doctors. Mm -hmm. And where they had gone, yeah, where they had gone from a... Um, a cesarean rate of over 50 percent it's mm. now around 22 percent mm. on the island so it, it it made a big difference but it wasn't something that our university could do nor something that our um, um, legislature was going to directly invest in we had to go out raise money start the practice mm. make it successful i see the, the next example is, is um, one of an allied health program that the medical school has um, been involved with for some time. Uh, this is the Communication Science and Disorders Clinic. It's also mm -hmm. known as Speech Pathology. And uh, those who graduate from this program uh, take care of those who've had strokes or other neurologic problems mm -hmm. to help them with speech and swallowing. And they also work in the public schools to help those students with special needs in learning language and speech. Mm. Uh, but to, to make this work, we, again, had to create a clinic, had to pay for that clinic, staff it, and um, build a practice because the university wasn't going to do this and um, the community was not uh, capable of pulling those things together. Mm -hmm. But it's something that we as a medical school felt was so important and that these uh, future uh, communication science specialists needed that clinical exposure. Uh, they couldn't just learn their practice in the classroom that we took this on. I see. Another uh, thing that is a little different than other parts of the U.S. is the uh, geriatric um, uh, department uh, that takes care of elder patients here uh, doesn't run a, a clinic to take care of patients because those patients' clinic time is just too demanding. So they work with the nursing homes and deliver care uh, coordinating a team of nurse practitioners and nurses mm -hmm. at the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And they're also now more actively engaged uh, in some of the larger health systems doing care management and helping manage the elder person while they're still uh, in, in the hospital and preparing them for their discharge home uh, from the hospital. Um, some of the other services we've done during the COVID, we set up a testing lab for some of the uh, uh, harder to reach communities. Uh, we helped oversee the reopening of the campus, not just in the medical school, but also 
the rest of the university. Uh, we worked with some coordination of public health and the community practitioners during COVID. And then um, for a long time, this the university has been engaged in global health initiatives. And uh, Dr. Machi has uh, taken the lead on that for our medical school. Uh, but it is fairly broad and, and quite uh, you know, important because there are many parts of the Pacific Islands that just don't have enough healthcare providers right. and a number of our programs have been essential for education and, and helping prepare uh, students uh, for going into medicine or nursing or social work. Yeah, you did a lot of leadership, you know, for these uh, many important projects, I think. It was very nice. Well, it's something like to say that, it, you know, the dean should be involved in those. The dean can't do it uh, all by uh, oneself. Uh, it takes a team, and you're there to support those who, who are on point uh, for that. And so, um, you know, when I was... Uh, serving as dean uh, prior to retirement, uh, and Dr. Machi took over much of the global health. Mm -hmm. you know, my role was to support him and help uh, his projects uh, succeed. Uh, and we've been involved with the Chubu Hospital training oh, yeah. program for <laughs> a long time, and that's one that Dr. Um, Machi knows very, very well. Um, so that's a bit about service. Advocacy is another key role for, mm -hmm. for the dean to be involved in. Uh, we have to work with the legislature. And one of the things we've been trying to do is to increase the uh, number of practitioners on neighbor islands. Mm -hmm. We have one island, Oahu, that has about 80% of Hawaii's population. And then a number of other islands that, that have a much less dense population. So what we have to do is, because there's less of a medical base and less of an economic base on those islands, which we call neighbor islands, uh, other than Oahu, um, we need to provide some financial incentives to help them with their practice, because it's a little harder to practice in the rural area without as many resources, mm -hmm. without as many referrals. So uh, in this case, um, since some of the doctors are willing to teach our students and our students therefore would be able to think about practicing in that setting, we worked with the legislature to get a tax credit so that they're, they would have, have less tax to pay for their practice on the neighbor islands and that would be in, in return for helping uh, teach our students. So it was a very sim symbiotic uh, relationship that has been very helpful for us. And, and to help get that through our legislature, we also worked with nursing and pharmacy so that they could have a similar arrangement for those uh, uh, teachers on the neighbor islands who were teaching their students. Uh, one of the things we're working on now is a supplemental tax credit for primary care doctors mm -hmm. working on the neighbor islands because we think that'll be a bit of an attractor to get uh, some of our graduates onto the neighbor islands. Um, I'm just going to sort of summarize some of the uh, other things that are there. Uh, as we, we advocated for health in our communities, we really wanted to do this holistically, where it wasn't just about what do the physicians do, but we worked with nursing, social work, uh, with the public health uh, program, and we went about it to do uh, training that was uh, interprofessional and also was going to create the workforce that could work together um, and uh, be prepared as a healthcare team. So we, we did that. We included some of that advocacy around community COVID uh, testing and tracing infections, doing that uh, inter, uh, professionally. So that, that's a big part of what we did. Uh, working with our colleagues also in the other um, you know, schools and professions here at the university, we also focus on um, sustaining and expanding our efforts in diversity. Now by that, um, 
which is a, a real big thing in the U.S. these days, is that there's a number of parts of the U.S. that don't have much uh, ethnic or cultural diversity. And people realize that um, culture and how people think about the world uh, and the advantages that they have or don't have will impact their health. So we have always strived to try to have a class that reflected the population of Hawaii, but other um, parts of the country have been less successful. But we feel that we need to continue with this and, and invest in that. And so one of the er things that has been around for now close to 50 years that we have, have enhanced over the last decade is a program called Imihoola, which is a post-baccalaureate program, a program that someone takes between their college years and their medical school years. Now, I realize in Japan, it's a seven-year program right out of high school. Well, six years. But in yeah. you, oh, six years. Oh, that's yeah, right. even better. <laughs> okay. But in the U.S., you have four years of college, then four years of medical school, uh -huh. and then your residency. But uh, we, we've added for some students an extra year mm -hmm. between college and medical school so that they could be prepared okay, to a greater yeah. extent for success in mm -hmm. medical school. Okay. Yeah, this uh, diversity at the end you wrote is uh, very important in the future, I think, in the uh, medical care but also you know many areas uh in the world and uh hawaii as you know as you said uh diversity is uh pretty key and uh, we have a lot of diversity of the population you know so that's that's good place uh over here <laughs> absolutely um and one of the things we're finding is that um it's not just the language that people have different languages. It's, it's how we use the language mm -hmm. often impacts our ability to diagnose someone. And so um, one, one of the strengths of our school is to give our students exposure to multiple cultures, right. multiple yeah, ethnicities. So, so um, I talked, a little bit about um, some of the innovations you want to do and the advocacy you want to do. Um, but there's also uh, some leadership competencies I mentioned that are important. Uh, I think in part because of my engineering training and my practice in emergency medicine, I had the opportunity to really think beyond just the one patient that might be in front of me, but really think about how do we manage multiple patients, both simultaneously and, and uh, in a preventive manner, as well as a, a treatment manner. And so thinking more broadly and working with individuals in complementary disciplines, I think opens up new opportunities and reinforces that innovation uh, uh, component I spoke of. But one of the um, things you have to be good at is getting resources to apply to the various challenges you want to address. And some of the programs, like we said, where we we're innovating here in Hawaii, one of the, uh, and I'll talk about what the potential resources are, at least from the perspective of here in Hawaii, but um, it's, it's really important for those of you who might think of entering a leadership position that realize that the decision making that you will have to do day after day is not deciding this is a good idea and over here is a bad idea i'm going to take the good idea the reality is you're going to have five or six really good ideas that you would like to do mm -hmm. but maybe enough resources for one or two of those mm -hmm. so it's how do you stage those how do you prioritize those and how do you gain more resources so you mm -hmm. can do more of those good things? Yeah. The, um, another important thing is active listening uh, and using that when collaborating. Um, there are a lot of folks who train outside of Hawaii and um, they get a lot of information and they think 
the world is the same everywhere they go. But that's one of the reasons that we've, you know, introduced global health mm. and other uh, components to help people be culturally humble and realize that much of the world is not what you see during um, your training, but can be quite diverse. And you have to be open to that. Mm -hmm. So that takes active listening and a willingness to collaborate. And even if you have the pleasure of being the leader, it doesn't mean you just come up with an idea and instruct someone to do something. You have to hear how they look at the idea and how they recommend because they have information that you have not yet acquired. Uh, so that, that's how you build teams uh, of people with different viewpoints, different uh, knowledge and experience. And we all know from the pandemic with COVID that uh, we have to be adaptable and resilient uh, mm -hmm. when we practice medicine. But it's even more important that, to have those skills if you're trying to lead an organization. And the last one I put on there because I, I realized that a lot of time when people get into um, a management or leadership role, they don't think that they, they have to go back and reassess how things work, how they're organized, and how, how the operations occur. They're ready to charge on and do something. But, but it's really important that you take the time and make sure that your organization is structured in a functional way and people understand it and they have clarity about what the roles are and that you give them the support to be efficient. Otherwise, you end up with very frustrated employees and, and collaborators. And uh, in the end, uh, a lot of projects fall apart that could have been done had you thought ahead and built the organization before you jumped into the project. Um, I was just going to say that through that systems thinking, uh, and that's another picture of Dr. Machi and myself <laughs> there in my old office, but um, we, we took on a number of educational initiatives at our medical school and research initiatives, um, you know, following the, the sort of, competencies I talked about with team uh, building and, and working from an efficient operation. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through and describe all of these uh, educational um, uh, innovations, but uh, we're, we're still working on some unique things like uh, the virtual anatomy. And we've got some partnerships with colleagues in Japan uh, looking at, at uh, taking that further. We also have what are called Dean's Certificates, which we developed where uh, people can spend additional time learning skills, um, whether it be related to health advocacy, whether it's related to research. And um, you can be recognized for doing more than just completing your medical school education, but it's, it's almost like a small uh, degree on top of your M MD, medical doctorate degree. Mm. And then um, we, we've done a number of uh, uh, new uh, approaches to research. Uh, we've got a vaccine uh, group uh, in our tropical medicine department that are looking at uh, how to develop vaccines for warmer climates. Because as you know, a lot of the uh, vaccines for COVID were part of a cold chain where you had to keep things uh, excessively cold. Uh, and so getting uh, vaccines and storing them uh, for uh, pa patients who are in tropical climates can be quite difficult. So we're working on uh, you know, those that are heat, heat stable uh, and having some good progress there. Uh, and then I, I talked before about our multicultural, multi-ethnic approach, and that's embedded not only in our educational process, but also in our research and also tied into work that we do with uh, the community. Uh, there's one project that we do with public health and social work that is based in um, one of the Native Hawaiian uh, communities, uh, homestead communities that is uh, doing aquaponics. So they're doing a, a cycle of growing fish on a lower 
um, aquaponic level and then in the mm. upper level growing vegetables and having fresh food for their family, uh, something that was difficult for them to do otherwise. Mm. So we're showing that having this capability to grow your own food is helpful for both not only your 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 knowledge of your health, but also um, you know treating diabetes, hypertension, and maintaining your weight with fresh fish and and, and vegetables. Um, the other thing on the research, I was just going to say, is that we we're, we're doing more in the area of genetics, but but uh, fortunately, our and you know and investigators are looking at the concept of epigenetics. That is, you know, you may have a gene that could do harm or could do good, mm -hmm. but unless that gene is turned on and active, it may have no impact whatsoever on your health. Mm -hmm. We're looking at what are the uh, environmental uh, or stress situations that turn certain genes on. And can we, you know, work with the uh, patients so that they don't have uh, genes that are causing excessive inflammation and leading to significant organ damage. Uh, so these are things that I think will change the way we think about and treat mm -hmm. diabetes, obesity, and cancer, and heart disease. It's even a pre prevention, maybe. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're interested in, in the prevention as much as <laughs> is the, uh, the treatment. Um, so I, I said, I just list the, uh, the sources of resources that we work with. Um, we, we have, as a medical school, applied for um, grants that help us significantly uh, with supporting our, our research. Uh, we uh, applied through a variety of channels, but much of the support is coming from the National Institutes of Health in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I have uh, personally been the um, uh, principal investigator for this R matrix and the Ola Hawaii mm -hmm. projects. Uh, two very large um, projects, uh, multi-year projects that have allowed us to train uh, early stage investigators and provide uh, support services to a number of other investigators. Oh, I see. We all as I, as I mentioned, like with the Hilo OBGYN doctors, uh, we also um, had developed a very effective practice plan. Uh, as Dr. Machi knows, we um, have gone through a transition where the health systems that we work with, the hospitals and clinics, um, rather than having them uh, contract for doctors to work, which we would do through our practice plan, they wanted to begin hiring their own doctors mm -hmm. uh, as part of their, their uh, health system. Mm -hmm. So we worked with them to acquire our faculty doctors, giving some positions of responsibility to our department chairs, and also giving us uh, a large number of additional faculty positions for our clinical education of students and residents. So th there are some things that have worked out very, very well with that, but it's still a program in its beginnings, but it all started with us developing a very strong university practice plan. The practice plan still exists and does a little activity outside of the health systems. Mm -hmm. One of the areas is we work with the School of Nursing to do a statewide Department of Education school nurse program. So we have nurses who are paid through the practice plan delivering health care in the schools across Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, again, working with the health system partners, we're trying to expand that. So it's not just the physicians, but there's support for nursing, social work, and uh, they're investing in, also in our resident training and fellowship training, which has been another goal of ours. Mm. So in addition to the health systems, there's also funds we sometimes get from the legislature. I mentioned that. And then finally, uh, philanthropy is an important part of fundraising for, for leaders here 
in, in the U.S., even working for a government organization. So our university is a state government uh, enterprise, mm-hmm. but we get a big part of our revenue from donors. And that philanthropy has helped us create programs that have been very helpful for right. our students. Medical students have to pay to go to medical school. Yeah. Um, but w- uh, And that is very expensive in terms of U.S. dollars. It's close to $60,000. So we have been raising monies to cover scholarships uh, with the uh, commitment that those who receive those scholarship monies come back and uh, practice here in Hawaii when their training's complete. I see. So that's been one of those uh, approaches we've used. Um, it's a little bit of a lag here. There we go. Uh, so just to mention a little bit about some of the synergy that we've been creating through collaborations with the uh, other health professions is that uh, for a long time, uh, there was a journal for uh, physicians that was called the Hawaii Medical Journal. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, journal that has been indexed by Index Medicus in, in the National Library of Medicine. But that uh, journal, uh, when the Hawaii Medical Association had some financial problems, uh, we needed to come up with a way to sustain it. So we partnered with our colleagues in nursing, social work, pharmacy, uh, public health, cancer center, and we renamed it as the Hawaii Journal of Health and Social Welfare. And we, as a collaboration, put money uh, to help cover the costs of this publication. But it is a fairly unique publication talking about advancing health in, in the Pacific. And some of you may publish in that journal in the future. We hope you will. Uh, I mentioned our interprofessional education initiatives, and we started a, a sort of a, a, a regular meeting of our leadership of the health sciences and, and health professions. We developed research teams that were across disciplines. So some of those um, National Institute of Health grants are actually grants that tie the medical school with other parts of the campus uh, so that we have a stronger team effect. And uh, also the practice plan is supporting some of the research and has done uh, some uh, work in the IT area in particular. Uh, and then uh, the medical school has collaborated for a long time with the, uh, the cancer center at UH. And there was actually a time for a little over a year and a half where I was both the cancer center director and the dean of the medical <laughs> school. <laughs> um, so just some final wisdom um, as we're closing. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to be a, a part of a lot of really nice things that have happened and helped change medicine. But those things fade over time. There's going to be a new dean. There's going to be new projects and that. Uh, the most important thing to help people move forward is really to um, show them progress, show them that you're making a good change, change that's helping them, and uh, make sure that they're learning in this process, that they're contributing and and they're becoming future, future leaders. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to transform our organizations, we have to first transform ourselves through learning. And I'm borrowing this uh, from Gary Bernstein, who is uh, the CEO of one of the larger U.S. companies who does searches for leaders. Mm. And he he says that the learning leader, you know, it all starts with the leader, but it's not about the leader. I mentioned that before. Um, So we have to elevate ourselves um, and by learning and our within the organizations. And so that attitude about continually learning, making yourself a better uh, servant leader is really important. And as Gary Bernstein says, it's the difference between being a learn-it-all and a Mm know-it-all. If you're a learn-it-all, you're always curious. You're always trying to learn 
what someone else knows that you don't know. Mm-hmm. And you're valuing their opinion. You're actively listening and interacting uh, with them so that you can learn more and help those that you serve and in your institution uh, to a greater extent. I wanted to, um, as a final word slide, just uh, mention about kuleana. This is a Hawaiian word that is used a lot in Hawaii, uh, almost as much as aloha. Um, But it has, uh, like aloha, more than one meaning, and that's why it's so important. It tells us that being a leader and having that kuleana is both a privilege and a responsibility. When you become a physician, uh, you have this wonderful education. You have a job which should give you income and financial stability. Uh, And there's status with being a physician and status with being associated with different institutions. Mm -hmm. There's also responsibility, which is to use that privilege to make a difference in your community Mm -hmm. and a difference in the world through your collective contributions for those that you're working with and leading. So um, I think those of us who've been here in Hawaii and have uh, tried to lead, you know, this is a really important message and part of what we do. Um, You know, we try to work in service and we recognize that we're given a gift, this, this privilege to lead, but it requires that we really focus on those we're serving. And then in final, uh, I just had this picture. This isn't our most recent class. This is actually class that graduated in 2020 uh, as the pandemic was beginning. But just uh-huh. just to show you the different faces here, um, you know, we really are multicultural, multi-ethnic, and having the students learn in that environment and learn from each other as well as their, their teachers is really, uh, you know, been a blessing and and a a great thing that we've been able to do. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn this back to you, Dr. Machi. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Thank you very much, Jerris. I learned a lot what you said today, (laughs) particularly uh, I recognize, I didn't know well, but uh, the role of Dean is a wide variety, including service, advocacy, uh, innovation, research, you know, collaboration, many, many things. And you have done these things and make uh, our university, uh, medical school, uh, pretty good, I think. And uh, when you start uh, uh, dean, only 55 students at at that time, beginning, about 60 students? Uh, Yeah, there was just 60 was what we were or bringing in yeah so we've we've grown the class size to 77 interim yeah, students right. so, so it's increasing, 77 times right. four yeah increasing the number of the students is uh, i know it's very difficult you know because uh, you cannot just uh you know, uh, uh, you know admit the patient but you need a uh, uh approval from the uh, you know lcme or whatever so but anyway uh particularly the i learn a lot about uh, leadership and uh, leadership is a very difficult you know I, I'm focusing very small area in some leadership but not much but uh, <laughs> you did a lot of leadership in a very variety of the areas and uh, that's really uh, appreciate uh, I think everybody appreciate your work you have done uh, thank you very much and uh, any last uh, words uh, for young generation? in Japan or even the United States? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, a couple of things. First, I think the similarities between the practice of medicine in Japan and the U.S. are much greater than the differences. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the way we approach patients is very similar in our commitment to the patient's well-being. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we've had many opportunities as a medical school to connect uh, with Japanese learners and instructors. Right. Uh, this, the second thing uh, I'd you know, like to say is that um, 
you know, everyone um, enters the profession with anticipation that they will contribute to you know, the, the care of, of patients. And I, I focused a lot in my talk about things that I did outside of the, the care of patients. Um, I, for over 30 years, I worked clinically in the emergency department, taking care of patients, uh, most of the time, one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes I would be managing multiple patients. But um, that skill that uh, we train for is, is very important, and it does help define who we are. But I'm hoping through this talk that um, those future physicians who are seeing this will realize that they can have a full clinical um, you know, career and then evolve into a leader in a variety of areas. They yeah. can do research, they can do education, they can do administration, they can do service. Uh, I happen to have touched on virtually all of those, <laughs> but not all simultaneously. Uh, there were, you know, there were, I would do one thing for a while and then switch yeah. gears and do something different. But, mm -hmm. but the, the, the message I've tried to give to medical students is learn how to be a good doctor, learn how to take care of patients. Mm -hmm. But don't lose sight of the fact that you can do so much more mm, than see. just care for the patient. Yeah, I understand that. Now, uh, similar thing I talk to, you know, young people, you know, uh, when I finish my residency or, you know, medical school, almost everyone just do the, you know, practice and taking care of the patient. And uh, not many people get into the uh, research or education, but now so many, you know, uh, opportunities. And uh, if you're interested in, uh, and also some skill, you can expand your, you know, uh, profession uh, beyond the uh, uh, patient care, the clinical work. So I really agree with that. I have one last question. You know, nowadays, AI and a robot, uh, do you think is, uh, you know, in a medical field a lot, you know, not just medical field, but uh, many areas, but particularly in the medical field, uh, maybe we now getting more popular uh, in many areas, uh, but maybe now young generation, high school, medical student right now, uh, when they finish the training and then uh, uh, start practicing, uh, it may be a next uh, 10 or 15 years, right, from now. So how do you think uh, medicine may change <laughs> uh, in terms of like a, in more like a involvement of the AI or a robot and other things? How do you think? <laughs> well, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm not uh, as good at predicting the future as I used to be. So... Uh, but I, I, I do think that it's intriguing. Uh, and uh, a colleague sent me an interesting article that was not about AI, but it was about human uh, memory. And it was about how, as we form memories, um, they're not rigid and mm -hmm. they're pliable and they will be changed with subsequent experiences. And so as I thought about that, I said, okay, well, we're sort of making the assumption that artificial intelligence will be fixed and rigid once it, you know, learns or sees something. But mm -hmm. no, it's going to be like human intelligence. We're going to continually evolve our impression. All In right. fact, it, it, you know, artificial intelligence must do that because if it just um, collects data that uh, existed, say, 10 years ago, and the science has moved on dramatically in the next 10 years, it, it's not going to be of great value to us. So I think um, it will play a role. It will be evolving. I think our task as physicians is to try to understand the concepts that are being used and make sure that the right 
concepts are being used and to continually validate that the information we're getting is correct. Uh, people have already shown with the current versions we have of AI that uh, AI can actually make things up that are completely false. So you can't assume everything is exactly as it appears. You have to do validation. So I think that'll be a very intriguing uh, task for those of us who are using AI to help with decision making. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's always been that way where, um, you know, as we develop tests, uh, the tests are imperfect. And uh, we learn how to apply the tests in a better way over time, but initially they may be applied in a way that's suboptimal and, and it's not ideal for our patients. So I think AI will, will evolve, but uh, it's an it's important area for our young doctors to watch. I see. So still human intelligence uh, is important and uh, evolving and uh... Uh, to do so, we have to always continuously learning, or, or, always, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I think AI <laughs> will learn along with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Jerris. And uh, it was very uh, nice to have you today. And uh, I'm so happy to have an interview with you today. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, aloha and mahalo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.